I'll, uh, uh, I'll go into those uh, cases, of course, right? Um, so I'm working on that full time with the team. Um, and uh, it's been a, been a lot of difference, of course, with uh, when I started 11 years ago as, as just a, a hobby thing. So um, I'll talk about, I'll start talking about the traveling salesman problem and the vehicle routing problem. Um, so uh, let me tell you the story of the ultimate American road trip. So um, there was a newspaper article about two or three years ago in the Washington Post and in the New York Times. And it was about, um, there was a guy who found the, what they claimed to be the optimal uh, American road trip. So, um, and this was copied in a lot of newspapers across the globe. So what was the goal of this, uh, what was his goal? Well, he wanted to do a road trip in the US uh, and visit all of these locations like, you know, typical tourist things like the Liberty Bell, the um, uh, Mount Rushmore, uh, Grand Canyon and so forth. And he wanted to figure out what is the, sh the quickest trip the quickest trip to visit all of these locations. So let's say I take my motorcycle uh, or my car and um, I wanna, I, I'm going to all of these locations. What is the quickest trip to visit all of these? Uh, so how many hours does it take me to be on the road? Um, and of course, the less time we spend in the car or on the bike, the more time we can actually enjoy uh, these, these uh, locations, right? So, um, this is uh, the result of a traditional algorithm. So for example, uh, let's say we start here in Louisiana, we go to Texas, New Mexico, and so forth, we go to these. So this is an order. And as you can see, this is really using real road, roads uh, on the map, of course, and real road distances. And this takes 271 hours to complete this. Does anybody think this is optimal? Does anybody know is this an optimal solution or is this not an optimal solution? Does anybody have an ID? Depends on the algorithm. It depends on the algorithm, that too, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's true. So some algorithms can guarantee that. But, but besides that, would you be able to say, okay, this is a good solution or a bad solution? As just looking at it, uh, get, getting an ID. It's pretty hard, right? It's impossible to know if this is the right solution. Yeah, uh, as a human, it's, it's pretty much impossible. Um, there's one, uh, one uh, uh, pitfall on that, though. Uh, there's one over here you can see uh, a cross. And that's actually uh, a no, that's why you know that this is actually not an optimal solution. But most of the time, you're right. It's, it's very hard to, or almost impossible for uh, as a human to figure that out. But this one is actually a clear sign that it's not optimal because it's actually, uh, because if you go like this and that, it will always be shorter. That's because of uh, a mathematical thing they call uh, triangle uh, inequality. That's so, um, but most of the time it's, in, it's, it's indeed hard to tell. Now, okay, we have 271 hours, right? And this is the algorithm, uh, this is the solution that the newspaper articles printed. So that the newspaper article said this is the optimal solution, right? Um, and this one is 232 hours, so it's 14% faster, right? Um, so that saves us 31 hours, 38 hours. Um, and this is done with a pretty sophisticated algorithm. And now the question is, is it optimal? So according to the newspapers, this is all optimal, but you know, are newspapers telling the truth? <laughs> um, and the answer of course is, no, it's actually not optimal. Because if you actually look, and for this one, if you would give it to me, I wouldn't know. Uh, you, I, I would not be able to tell you, unless I've seen the problem before, that this is optimal or not, without uh, actually running some algorithms myself, of course. So if we jump into this one, this is how the, um, the newspaper article, so that's uh, Olson's solution, did it around Iowa. You can see them going to Minneapolis, Wisconsin, Kansas, then back to Illinois. And um, this is what I found, of course, with my implementation with OptoPlanner, but uh, other constraint solvers actually tried this one too and they found it too. And you can see if you actually go here through Kansas and then to Minneapolis, you can save one hour and 35 minutes. So one hour and 35 minutes faster by using a, a better algorithm. And I have to tell you, this algorithm was already very good. It was not a traditional algorithm anymore, not something you would find in the average company. It was really a good algorithm already. Okay, so um, the other thing he took into account, well, he believed that uh, he, in his implementation, he presumed that the roads were symmetric, which basically means if you go from A to B, and it, and it takes, let's say, 10 hours, then from B to A, it will also take 10 hours. Now, in reality, 
there's a, a problem with that. Let's say we go from B to A, we drive towards location A, um, and this would be fine, right? So we go with the, around the purple route. However, if you would do the same thing, leaving from A and you get back, you leave from A and you drive up, you take up the highway here and you drive like this on the highway, you would be in trouble, right? Um, uh, as of last night, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a problem here, but, uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, but uh, um, and, in, and, and for the record, in England, this is not a problem at all because they drive on the left side of the road. Um, but of course, in the real world, um, you can see that we have to drive the other way around, right? Uh, so in the real world, we'll always get in trouble when we do this, right? Oh, it's definitely not safe. So, um, okay. Um, if we take this into account, this is his solution, this is part of his solution. Uh, so he got 231 hours, but of course, um, we calculated this 231 hours using the asymmetric data, right? And uh, he got basically two trips, one clockwise, one counterclockwise. This is the fastest one of those two, right? Because they have different results because of the, that fact with the, um, that roads are asymmetric. Now, if you actually take that into account that these roads are asymmetric in the algorithm, in the solver, right, and we just don't, we don't, we don't make this rounding error, we actually take this into account, what you will see is we actually get uh, a different trip. So it actually matters using the correct data in your solver, um, you know, not presuming roads are symmetric, for example. And you can see we, we now go to here first and then go to the coast, which is apparently faster. It's 49 minutes faster in the calculations. And on top of that, um, we also get a direction. You can now see we're driving this uh, road clockwise. So it's actually telling us which way to drive this. It's not really a big surprise that uh, we have to drive clockwise. Anybody got an idea why it's not a big surprise that we, that's all, all usually almost faster to drive clockwise on a map, except in England. That's, that's a little hint. <laughs> yeah, so because of the fact that going right on, an in, on, a, on, a, on a crossroad is always faster than going left, uh, except of course in England, where it's vice versa. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, Again, this is also in strip. It's not optimal. This was a very good solution. It's near optimal, um, high quality solution actually. And uh, this is uh, what we found with Opta Planner, uh, the 231 hours. So it's two hours faster. So the, the sum of those two gains we did there. Um, so it's 1% faster. So that's 15% in total over the traditional algorithm. So the thing to compare to is usually the traditional algorithms. This is what what you will see today in production, this is what you will see with most companies when they implement something, or when they have human planners doing the, these kinds of things. Um, this is the numbers that I usually see, and this is the difference that we get with advanced algorithms. And you can argue that 1% more or less might not be that big thing, because just using a good uh, advanced algorithm is already a, a big jump forward. Um, it's also shorter, by the way. It's 30 kil 30 kilometers shorter, but we didn't optimize on distance. We optimized on time. And you can do, of course, take both into account, but in this case, we didn't do that. We just watched, uh, we just looked for, out for time. So uh, let me do, give you a quick demo on, on, on uh, traveling salesman. Uh, so this is actually called the traveling salesman problem. So let me just give you a quick demo. So here's uh, the optoplanar examples. So, here we take, uh, of course, there's another, let's, let's talk about, uh, so this is uh, Europe, uh, so I, I, I apologize for not including Mar Mar um, uh, Morocco here, but of course, uh, these are the, all the capitals of Europe, um, so we want to make a trip to all of these capitals, and we want to find the shortest path to do that, and in this particular case, we're going to presume that we can actually fly for distance. So on the top, on the bottom right, we actually have the distance, how long this takes, so when we start solving this, you will see that OptoPlanner finds a solution, and as you give it more and more time, it actually finds a shorter and shorter solution, right? Um, of course, this, there's a law of diminishing returns. At some point, uh, it can't find a better solution anymore, and this is actually uh, the optimal solution. And now what I'm going to, sh so this is, we start from Brussels, for example. Uh, we go to Paris, London, Dublin, Reykjavik, Lisbon, and so forth. Uh, and this is basically the shortest path. Now, one of the nice things we can actually do is we can actually, in real time, add locations. So let's say we want to stop here between Lisbon and Madrid. 
And this is one thing where, where we, if we, if I click here and add a location, you can see we've just added a dent, right? And we can add a bunch of locations. Let me just click around in, uh, okay, this is going to be hard with the mic. So as you can see, I just clicked around, added the number of locations in southern France, and it all takes into, into those into account. Of course, this is not using real world uh, road data. It is presuming we can fly, and apparently we're going to somewhere in the middle of the uh, sea because I clicked there. So um, this is not, uh, so, you know, in a, real, uh, in a real world example, we would uh, tie this into Google Maps or OpenStreetMap, and of course, um, this wouldn't resolve, of course, right? Okay, now the interesting thing about this example is what happens when I click here between these two locations. So you have Budapest here, Bratislava, and you have um, Warsaw, yes. So um, I'm going to click and add a location here. And notice that now in the top path, Warsaw is part of the top path. It's going like this, right? So when we add location here, you might just think, okay, we go to that location from Budapest and we go back to Bratislava. But look what happens. So as you can see, Warsaw jumped. So even though we, we just added something between Budapest and Bratislava, Warsaw jumped from the top line into the bottom line. There was a side effect. So adding one location can affect it's like pull, pulling a string, and then all of a sudden something happens there. And that might affect something that happens there, which might affect something that happens here, which might affect your entire solution. <laughs> Let me show you that in detail. Here we go. Um, oh. oh, okay, so uh, here we go. So here we have. Um, Three solutions for the traveling salesman problem, which is basically the problem of the American road trip too. So, and both of them, all three are optimal. So this is the shortest path with green lines to visit these locations. And in all three locations, we're going to add one new location, and see what the effect is on the optimal solution. So um, here we have, what is it? About, I guess, eight points. So we add a ninth point, and you can see that there's just, there's really no effect. There's just a small bump here, right? Makes sense. See, that's the new optimal solution. Now let's see what happens if you add a new location in here. If you do that, you can see that uh, we now have a side effect, right? So uh, this location, which was in the top arc, is now in the bottom one, right? Okay, in the top edge. Um, and now we add one here, over there. And in that particular case, the optimal solution changes like this. It's completely different, right? There's a snowball effect. Uh, by adding just, just extra one location. So that's really interesting. So you have an optimal solution for a data set of n. You add, you change your problem a little bit, and your optimal solution might change very, a lot, right? Um, and this is one of the, the biggest problems in, in these kinds of use cases, that um, you know, splitting them up and, and things like that, they don't work well, and this is the main reason why. Right? I'll, I'll go and get into that a little bit later. So, um, oh. Let's talk about that right now. So uh, here we have um, uh, a number of locations where we want to find the shortest uh, distance to. to. This is our about 60, 68 locations, if I recall correctly. And uh, what we'll use is we'll use the algorithm they taught us when we went to computer science. They told us, you know, use divide and conquer. Or these days, you know, um, MapReduce is a little bit more an advanced form of that. Uh, but it's, it's basically the same ID. We take this problem. And it's too big for us to solve. So let's presume it's too big for us to solve, which, which it is actually to, to do it brute force, but OK. Um, and we just split it up in four pieces, right? Um, and pieces, but in this case, I'll just take four, all right? And then we'll solve those four pieces optimally. Now, let's just presume we can solve these four pieces optimally, right? Uh, you might think, OK, that's easy, but still, there's still a number of there's still a bunch of locations here, and it, it might not be as easy as, as you might think. But then, okay, so we have four pieces that are optimal. We paste these pieces together. So this piece on that piece. We take the best choice there for the connecting ar uh, arcs, and uh, we paste that again together, and so we get this solution. Now the question is, is that solution optimal? So it is basically the merger of these four solutions. No, anybody else? Okay, so no, it's, it's not optimal, you're correct. Um, and the reason it's not optimal, uh, so 
let me first show you that it's not optimal. So you can see this is the, the distance for that solution. And you can see we save uh, about 30 points in this particular case, 32 points, by going uh, by using that one. So um, my point here is, is not that MapReduce is bad. MapReduce is a brilliant algorithm for things like queries, figuring out what is the average wage uh, and all kinds of other queries you might do on a big data set. It is not the best solution for, uh, uh, for things like the traveling salesman problem and other constraint solving problems. So the right tool for the job, basically. And, and of course, you would not use things like OptoPlanner on things like where you need queries, of course, right? The right tool for the job. Okay. But what is the cost? I mean, one time or another, you, you should spell this up. Yeah. You just gain it to your friends. To your friends, just is way too complex for yeah. entry class. So, so. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, the cost right now, here's only one constraint. And the constraint is the distance, right? So that's basically the cost function. We can add additional constraints, like for example, um, I'll show some in a minute. Um, and the other thing is, of course, you can ask, okay, is it that, that 30 points, you know, if it just represents $100 more of, of, of wage that we'll have to pay, eh, maybe it's not worth it, right? So um, that's interesting. So I'll, let me jump to the next slide and, and show you some benchmarks there. I'll try to answer your question. So. Uh, the traveling salesman problem is an academic problem. Basically, nobody, no business has this problem. They all have, a lot of businesses have the vehicle routing problem. In fact, every store that you visited in the last three weeks probably has a vehicle routing problem. They need to be restocked every morning. So uh, depends, of course, how many, or at least their suppliers have a vehicle routing problem. <laughs> That's pr probably a better uh, thing here. So what is it? So we have uh, a depot in the middle where we have our uh, items that need to be delivered to our location. So for example, at this delivery location, we need to uh, maybe restock food every day because it's a supermarket. Uh, at this location, we might need to, you know, um, this or, or clothes or things like that, right? So basically, any, any store that you might see when, when driving around um, uh, on the streets, uh, they, these are these, these stores that need to be refi uh, refilled, right? So what we want to do is, of course, we want to do this as efficiently as possible. So what kind of constraints do we have? Well, the first constraint we, that we have is that each vehicle has a maximum capacity, right? In this particular case, the maximum capacity is, for this vehicle, 20 ton, and can actually differ per vehicle, of course. And we need to deliver 10 tons over here, 3 tons over there, and so forth. A vehicle cannot carry more than it can actually uh, carry uh, than it uh, than, its, than its capacity, right? Uh, we might have other constraints like expensive delivery over here, where we need to use an armored vehicle with an extra guard inside, or uh, time windows where we need to deliver this between 8 and 10 a.m. because then the store is open and there's somebody there to open the door, um, things like that. Um, and then these are all hard constraints. You can see them; they are colored red. These are hard constraints. That means if we don't uh, do those constraints, if we don't uh, fulfill those constraints, we don't have a feasible solution. And basically, uh, we cannot execute it. So, for example, if you put 25 tons in a vehicle, it simply doesn't move, right? Uh, or it's not legal, or things like that, right? Um, on top of that, we have soft constraints, which are the orange ones. So, for example, doing this optional, this can wait a day, this will have an impact on, on the cost or on efficiency. But the, mo the biggest soft constraint here is the driver's wage. For example, for in this particular case, for example, it's twenty dollars an hour. So the the less time we spend on the road, the less uh, the more efficient our company is, right? And the more uh, basically our profit or uh, not necessarily profit, this extra time you can then you know you can use this in different ways. You know, managers will always think, okay, we need to go more profits, but unions will then think, oh, more time for the drivers. You know, they can be they can work less for the same amount. And of course, the real you know there's a negotiation going on there, uh, which managers usually win though. But okay, um, well they don't really all usually win it, but they win like the 60, 70 percent of it. Uh, whatever the case. So um, here's the users. So the uh, users are supermarkets, real re retail stores, uh, things like freight, freight transportation. So if you have to transport. Uh, items uh, like like FedEx, DHL, and so forth. Uh, this is a typical case, but also where you are transporting uh, buses, taxis, and airlines, and so forth. So it's not just about saving money; it's also about improving service quality. If you can make sure, and and this of course depends on the implementation. Some. 
depending on, on the organization, they will focus more on things like uh, profit or they will sp spend more time focusing on things like service quality, customer care, um, and employee re retention and employee happiness and so forth. Um, so, okay, uh, but of course you can put all these constraints in there, you weight them, and then depending on how you weight them, one or the other will, will be more important. Um, and another one is technicians on the road, uh, where you, for example, when you have to install, uh, to, to install cable in your, um, uh, in your home, they might come to your home and they might install it. Again, there's time windows, they need to show up before 10 a.m. because then you have to leave for work and things like that, right? So what we saw is we saw an, uh, an, an improvement in the arriving time of 15%, right? So this is on average. Uh, this is a compared against the traditional algorithms, right? And I'll explain a little bit later what these traditional algorithms are. But, um, and you can also see there's a difference. The biggest data set had 9% only, uh, sorry, not the biggest one, but some data set only had 9%, and other data set had 18%. So um, there's, there's, there's some variation on that, of course. Okay, so uh, let me show you a quick example there. Um, so we have this example in OptoPlanner 2. Um, I also have, uh, I didn't start up the, v, uh, the one with Google Maps integration. Okay, I'll, I'll just show this one. Um, so here we are sending a number of vehicles to these locations. This is with the uh, this is just with, uh, without uh, using actual street distances. And you can see as we give it some time, it actually gets a better and better solution, as you can see, uh, and shorter. Now, if I stop at any moment of this, it's actually quite hard to see if this is optimal or not, as spoken before. And um, so when humans, uh, as you do this currently with, by hand or with an, a traditional algorithm, you might think, okay, this is a pretty good solution. And then you might not know there's a better solution. So that's one thing we, we, typically, we typically see. Uh, so, of course, also in this case, we can do real-time planning, like adding locations, and then it takes those into account, of course. And you can see it's still improving. Uh, it, it reacts on that, of course. Okay. Um, so, we leave here. We go over there, deliver two items. We leave, deliver seven items there, 21 items there. In total, this uh, truck is carrying uh, 73 items. It can carry 100 items. Okay. Um, we can do with time windows. Um, and we have, uh, um, and this is uh, all implemented on plain old Java objects. So I'll get into the code later. Um, but here we have time windows where you have to be with between 12 and 1 o'clock at this location. And you can see this is an artificial example from the academic world. But you can see we first drive here, deliver the, uh, stay there for an hour, then drive over here, stay there for an hour, and so forth. Right? Um, okay. Um, and uh, let me. Uh, Close this. So uh, I, we can also do this with Google Maps. Normally, I haven't opened. Um, I have. I, we actually have a web app. I haven't booted it today. I can maybe boot it in the background or during the break. Uh, but this is a result which we get from uh, is sol solving a case with Opto Planner on uh, a Belgium data set. So you can see the green vehicle is. is uh, leaving here, drives over there, delivers those items, those items, those items, and so forth, and, and returns back to the city. And these are actually taking actual road distance into account. So that's a big difference, for example, um, if you're driving over the river, the bridges really make a lot of difference. You know, two locations that are very close to each other, if there's a river in between, are uh, problematic, you know, are not a shortcut, let's put it like that. Okay. Um, so how do we integrate with real maps? So we have a number of locations on the map, A, B, C, D. We know the latitude and longitudes of those cases. Um, we send those to Google Maps or to Graphhopper, uh, uh, which is an open street map implementation, which you can do locally or through REST call. Google Maps is a REST call. And you basically ask, OK, given A, B, and C, and D, right? and this can be four locations in this case, but it could also be 4,000 or 40,000 locations. Um, once you read up to above 10,000, though, uh, it becomes uh, quite memory-wise and, uh, and scaling-wise a problem, and you need to start looking into partitioning. Even though I said earlier partitioning is bad, once you get above 10,000 locations, uh, it is the lesser evil. Let's put it like that. Uh, but anyway, so we have here uh, these five locations. And we basically get back a, map, uh, a matrix saying, OK, driving from A to B is 30 uh, minutes. From A to C is also 30 minutes. A to D is 60 minutes, right? So we actually get this map. Now, here we don't know which order will drive yet. Right? So we just have a combination of every location to every other location, how long it will take. 
Um, and you can see, of course, going from A to C is only 30 minutes because of this big highway there, right? Even though from A to B and B to C, it's 30 minutes, 30 minutes. So that, that's, that's quite interesting too. Um, okay, so we solved that with Optoplanner Planner um, or another constraint solver, of course. Um, and you basically take this input data and you add your hard and soft constraints. So this is just about one constraint, about time. Right or about distance, you can put in distance, find out distances too, and put that in too. But there's all those other constraints like weight, capacity, and so forth. And you need to take all of those into account too. And of course, uh, you do that, and then you get the solution. For example, where it says, okay, first go to A, then go to C, then go to B, then go to D. That's the most efficient way of doing it, given all of these constraints. And then you visualize that on the map. So I, uh, earlier I showed it on Google Maps, but you can also do it with Leaflet.js, which is um, an open, uh, open source implementation of uh, basically Google Maps, more or less the same. Um, and that's based on OpenStreetMap. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the vehicle routing problem. Uh, let me now jump into the uh, more general. What are pl planning problems? Because this was just one kind of planning problem, and I'll jump into some other cases right now too. So not just vehicle routing. But before we do, I want to explain what is, in general, what is a planning problem. So we want to optimize goals with limited resources under constraints. So optimize goals. For most companies, that's quite simple. Maximize profit, right? Uh, for government organizations, they care a lot about their employee happiness and service quality, and a lot of pro companies care about uh, customer quality, of course, too, and, and uh, employee retention, too. And some cases also a lot about uh, minimizing uh, ecological footprint because that's good for their the company's reputation or, or the government's reputation, right? Now, you might see that some of these are fighting against each other, adversary, but in a lot of cases, we can create a win-win situation. If you drive less with your vehicles, less time with your vehicles, if you are more efficient with your vehicles, you will save money because you will uh, spend less time in the car, you will consume less fuel, but you will also actually help the planet. So that's a very nice uh, side effect, right? Um, limited resources. Um, we have employees, uh, assets such as machines, buildings and vehicles. We have time, we have budget. So those are our resources. and. Under those, we need, you have limited constraints. For example, um, employees, they cannot wor work 24 seven, right? Um, so we have working hours, and depending on the country, the, the, there are the labor regulations which might say, okay, you can only work 10 hours a day or eight hours a day or, uh, or, or you know, whatever the case, and we need to, we need to adhere to those. Um, if you work five days in a row, six days you need a break, right? Depends on also the sector you're working on and so forth. Um, so we want to take care of all of those things. Um, so these are all constraints. Things like um, the, the logistic conflicts. If we send a vehicle to from uh, in one direction, it's not going to be in the other direction, right? So we cannot send 30% of the vehicle to say, let's say Casablanca and 70% to Marrakesh, right? We need to send, you know, a vehicle is, a, is, is one unit, right? So um, what kind of problems do we have is the vehicle problem, as, as I explained earlier. Um, I'll go into the employee rostering one in a second, um, too, and uh, I don't think I'll have time for the cloud balancing one. In this one, we assign processes to machines and try to optimize our cloud to uh, increase utilization. Um, another one is a make span, where you're building something like, uh, for example, cars or books or furniture, and by using the machine, by scheduling those the jobs on the assembly lines, you can make it more efficient by deciding which book or which car you'll produce in which order. For example, um, if you put all the red cars after each other, you can, uh, you can reduce your, uh, your paint uh, costs because you can work more efficiently. Um, and uh, then is there also equipment scheduling, for example, in hospitals, assigning beds or CAT scanners or things like that to people more efficiently. So basically, with the same CAT scanner, you can serve more people. So that's typically uh, a governmental use case, of course, right? Um, but uh, the list goes on. I'm, I'll not go through all of these. Uh, cool ones are TV advertisements. Make, when you are sign, deci decide which advertisement to show at which time and try to optimize uh, for example, don't do a Coca-Cola commercial and then a Pepsi one after each other. So that those kinds of constraints uh, uh, play into that one. Uh, we have uh, court scheduling 
um, is uh, is being used a lot for Opto uh, with Opto Planner. So assigning basically judges to hearings and things like that, um, and then many more maintenance of uh, machines or elevators or things like that. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So Opto Planner is open source, by the way. It's Apache license, um, so you can just use it on Maven Central. Just and uh, there's a you know you find the documentation and the examples, of course, right? Everything you would expect from a from a series open source project. Um, yes, and it works on, uh, you know, uh, on, yeah, it's Java, it works everywhere. Uh, we have people using this from Scala, Groovy, Kotlin these days, of course. So it's not just Java. Any JVM language is fine. Um, and we have people using this on, on uh, of course, Wildfly. Uh, um, I work for Red Hat. But uh, also Jetty, Tomcat. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. It's just plain old Java. You don't need a container, you, uh, so you don't need an app server. Uh, Spring Boot works. I tested it the other day, um, but you need uh, you just need plain old Java. At least Java for the latest version, you need at least Java 8. For an older version, you can just, just still use Java 6. Um, so one question I sometimes get um, is: This a form of AI, a form of artificial intelligence? Because you know the new hype, everything is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and th things like that. Um, so um, and the the answer is yes, it's a form of AI. But let me explain why. Because uh, if you take the, the the academic world, the big books, the big blue book about AI, you will see that this is covered too. Uh, but it's not machine learning. It's not neural nets. Um, so it doesn't have all the hype, or just a few, right? So um, let me explain uh, about how this works. Let's let me explain three different cases of AI. So for example, a full text search is a form. Uh, some people might claim of AI. It's at least in the big book. So you have a cat, for example, the word, and what you want to get out of that is a list uh, of files. For example, in this PDF, we describe about that. This is what you see on Google search, for example, right? Um, another use case you might have is, okay, I have an image here. I need to know what this is. Is this a cat? No, it's, it's not a cat. It, 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 is a it is a dog. So you want to get the word dog out of that. This is your input. This is your output, right? Um, another use case is the one I've just shown, the vehicle routing problem. We have a case where we have a number of locations and a number of uh, vehicles and a number of constraints. And we want to have reduce our driving time, right? Or um, potentially other constraints in there. Um, now. The interesting, the important thing to understand with the new hype, but a lot of decision makers, I believe, uh, sometimes fail to see, is using the right algorithm, the right tool for the right job. So here you want to use a vector space model. Um, I'll, I'll get it in a minute. Here you want to use the neural net, and that's of course the constraint solvers. Um, so basically, um, you have to use the right algorithm for the job. So in the vector space model, use cases in include like recommendation similarities. They are really great for that. Uh, voice recognition, machine translation are for neural nets. These are, this is the big hype today, right? TensorFlow and things like that. Um, great, great tools, but use them for the right thing. If you have an image recognition problem, OptoPlanner cannot help you, of course, right? And none of the constraint solvers can help you. Um, you need to use uh, a neural net and vice versa. There's people who tried using neural nets on these kinds of problems. And they actually do get some output, but it's consistently inferior. It's, it's like uh, they're, they, they get like 1% improvement on vehicle routing while we get 15%. So uh, there's papers around that. Lots of people have tried. Just you know, use the right tool for the right job. Right? Um, OK, so yeah. So for example, here's a uh, very nice implementation. It's, of course, Apache Lucene. Here you have TensorFlow and Deep Learning for J. And of course, here's OptoPlanner and a couple of others, of course, too. Um, and this doesn't stop with these three, right? Um, if you want to do, for example, a, the, for pathfinding, look into a search for prediction rule systems, look into our uh, rule engine, for example. If you do cluster analysis, things like k-means, and, and this is, doesn't stop. What most people, what most decision makers don't understand is there's a lot of AI is very big, and each of these subdomains is again very big. Right, so they have one use case, and they believe you know um, they see they have a hammer and they see nails everywhere. Right, so this is a hammer, great for nails. Don't use it on screws. Right, that's that's pretty much the typical advice here. Right. Yeah. Well, the question is still unanswered. Is it AI or not? Um, yes, because but that's more for the academic world. So why is it AI? Uh, um, so well. First of all, it has a long history of being in, 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 in the, it's the academics who more, more or less decide that, right? So if you take the big book of um, Peter Norvig, 
Um, you'll see it's, uh, it's, it's included there. Um, you can, so there are some people might say these days, you know, neural nets is the only thing that's AI because it has the word neural in it. So it sounds like, you know, you use your brains. Well, this has t horrible names, right? Local search, that doesn't sound very smart, right? Uh, double search, that doesn't sound smart. This, this calls neural, you know, machine learning neural nets. We really are, I really hate the persons who chose our names actually, <laughs> thinking backwards. But, um, you know, uh, that, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So we have, but yeah, it's hard. Yeah, you're right. It's it's sometimes hard to say say where it is. But uh, yes, that's 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 definitely the case. Uh, what do you mean? Oh yeah, so you have hybrids. So for example, you can say, um, I'm going to use a, a constraint solver to tune the hyperparameters of a neural network. That's for example, uh, I haven't seen much research around that. There's some people I think that were interested, but I don't know if it's a good or bad idea yet. Um, vice versa. Um, for example, um, you might have heard that uh, Google beat the, the world's leading Go champions and they used a neural net for that. Well, in fact, they didn't just use a neural net, they used something called the Minimax algorithm, which is totally nothing related to a neural net in itself, and uh, which went 20 levels deep. Uh, it's a way of going through, you know, deciding things. And at level 20, to score the quality of that solution, they used a neural net. So, um, so they use a hybrid there. So I think there's a lot of uh, you know, there's there's hybrid possibilities here. You know, the right tool for the right job. But I also believe that uh, these hybrids are complex. You know, each and one of these are already complex. You, it's hard to be an expert in two of these. Once you start doing hybrids, it's 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 it's, it's challenging. Um, but for certain cases, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about employee shift rostering. And and I'll I'll actually this example I'll go through the Java code and show you how you can implement this yourself. Right. Uh, it's DevOps, we have to show code, of course, right? Uh, enough slides, right? Um, so, um, let me first explain the case. We have a number of employees. You can see them here. In this case, only four because only that many could fit on my slide. Uh, we have a number of shifts. So, we have uh, an early shift, an early shift, an early shift, a late shift, a late shift, and here, two free days for that person, right? We can also have night shifts, like over here. So an early shift starts at 6 a.m. until 2, 2 p.m., uh, a late shift 2 p.m. till 10 a.m., uh, till, till 10 p.m., and the night shift, of course, from 10 to 6. Um, so we have a number of constraints here. Let me show you the constraints. So for example, we can only do one shift per day, right? Uh, a nurse, for example, in this case, a nurse cannot be at two places at the same time. That's the physical limitations that we <laughs> all uh, live under. So, um, and she can also, also do only one shift per day even. So uh, two shifts at the same time is, are physically impossible, but even she cannot do two shifts at the same day uh, in this implementation as it was uh, implemented here, of course. Uh, some cases, some organizations might say, okay, there are Exceptions to that, sometimes a, sh a, sh a nurse can do a sh double shift, but of course this will affect the score function and will affect how the quality of the solution, uh, uh, of course. Um, here's interesting things like forward rotation. This is very good for uh, increasing uh, the health of the employees. Basically, you don't have a late sh shift and f starting with a morning shift, because if you have a late shift that ends at 10 a.m., at 10 p.m. and you have a morning shift at 6 a.m. You only have eight hours in between. The nurse has to go home, get back to the hospital. It's 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 not um, uh, it's not healthy. She doesn't get enough sleep. Um, five consecutive shifts. So after five days in a row or six days in a row, we need uh, a, a day off. Um, require the nurse re skill. So this particular shift requires somebody who has the nurse sh uh, skill. So this these two employees cannot fulfill that shift. These two employees can't fulfill that shift. That's a pretty hard, uh, that's a hard constraint, and a, and a, and a typical one. Uh, you might also have things like affinity. Um, this is something you know. The, this nurse usually works on that department, so let's try to plan her there. That's usually soft constraint affinity. So skill is hard, affinity is soft. 
the off requests, that's the big one here. That's the one that um, is very hard to do because there's lots of these. these nur this nurse says, I don't want to work on Friday because on Friday I'm going out, right? Um, and the other nurse says, I don't want to work on Wednesday because I'm taking care of my grandchildren, right? So you have a lot of these kinds of constraints where they say, I don't want to work that day or I prefer not to. Um, and uh, a couple of other constraints, right? So where we see this, hospitals for nurses, right? Courts of justice assigning magistrates to hearings and st stuff like that. Um, any, uh, no, any kind of shifts where people are working, not just nine to five, but uh, in maybe two or three shifts a, a day, right? I mean, in, in a rotation of two or three per day. Um, call centers and so forth, right? Uh, so what do we see here? I did the benchmarks, of course. We took uh, 26 bench, uh, data sets. Uh, the biggest data set was, was only for 50 employees is where the academic data set weren't that big data sets. Um, now what we see is a 53% improvement over traditional algorithms. And I'll explain the traditional algorithms uh, later. Okay, so let me give you a demo on this and then let's jump into the code. So, uh, here we go. So this is, the, uh, this is an implementation uh, which you can actually, uh, this is on GitHub, it's called OptaShift Employee Rostering. And uh, you can deploy it locally on uh, any uh, uh, EE container. Uh, so, for example, Wildfly, of course. Um, so, how does it work? We have a number of spots, right? And we have a number of employees. Let me first show you the employees. We have, for example, Amy Cole, and she has the skills of electrical engineer and mechanical engineer, right? We have Amy Fox, who is just a mechanical, and Amy Green. Electrical, you can see that the names are generated. This is not real data. Um, and so we have a number of skills per person. Uh, and then we have a number of spots. For example, um, th we're building a car in this particular case. So first, we're building an, it's an assembly line in a factory. We're building a car. We put in the battery. To put in the battery, you need electric electrical skill. To put in the bumper, you need the mechanical skill. So these are all spots on the assembly line. They need to be fulfilled, right? And then. We have a spot roster. So on Wednesday morning, we, we need one person at the battery, one person at the bumper. Um, on Wednesday afternoon, we need one person at the battery. Oh, let's say we need three, two persons for the chassis then. So let's add one here. OK. Uh, and let's say, OK, sunroofs over here. We have three sunroofs. Let's delete one. Don't really mind. OK, let's, let's just delete a few. Let's say we, we're not building cars with sunroofs this week. We don't have any orders like that. so. We're going to remove them from Wednesday. And then we're going to try to assign these. Now, one of the constraints is that skill constraint. That's just one of them. I'll explain the others in a minute. But let's solve this first. So what you'll see what, happen, uh, what happens is we get, uh, for the battery, it's still solving, as you can see. It's still improving things. But you can see it's assigning people. So for example, at the battery, it's now Hugo Watt. If you give it a little bit more time, it might select somebody else. Um, so the skill is actually quite easy to fulfill, right? Because it checks, okay, this is a battery, who can I put there? Okay, I can put who or what there, for example, right? Okay. Um, um, the, 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 the yeah, it, 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 it does affect the results, but not the quality of the results. So there's, um, there's often many good solutions that are very different, uh, but that doesn't mean that because there are many solutions, they're easy to find because there's many, 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 many more. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's still a needle in a haystack stack to find, actually. In some situation, we need to, to have a solution, a new solution that is, so, uh, that is not so far. Yeah. Yeah, that's non disruptive replanning. So what you do is you then add an extra constraint that says, this was my original solution. Every time you diverge from that, every, every assignment that diverges from that, uh, you lose some points. And basically, the points you lose will outweigh the gain or, or not. So the, the, your, your gain should outweigh the points you lose on the difference. Uh, and then you, so and by, what? Yeah, for example, yes. Uh, that's basically it, yes, the Hamming method. Okay, so, um, Okay, we have our roster here. So now let's look at the same data. So we have Hugo Watt working on the battery. Uh, so this is the manager's point of view. Yes, I have, you know, everybody, uh, my assembly line is full. I will not get into trouble, it, it will work. Um, now let's see what happens if we look at it from the employee's point of view. Here we go to, let's go to Hugo Watt, was that right? Here we have Hugo Watt over here. 
Um, so we can see he's working on the battery on Wednesday morning and he's working on the sunroof uh, Thursday morning. So um, we have a number of actual constraints in here. So one, const one shift per day. You can see Hugo only has one shift per day. This is on Wednesday. Uh, this is on Thursday, right? Um, you can also see there's another constraint in there, at least 10 hours between two shifts. Um, and in fact, uh, because the shifts are always eight hours, it basically means two free shifts between uh, any two assignments. So you can see that here too. Here we have somebody working in the afternoon, two free shifts, and then the next one, right? So that's another constraint. And then the last constraint is what I call the traffic lights, which are these colors you see here. And um, if somebody says, uh, like Elsa Rice, she says, I can, I'm unavailable on Wednesday morning, right? Or she has taken uh, PTO, she's on vacation. So we, we click this in as, as red, right? So she might not be able to do this herself, might be her manager, that depends, of course. But as you can see, if, if she's unavailable, she does not get any shift, right? Uh, the yellow ones are um, I, I, uh, undesired. So I didn't take PTO, but I just hate working Friday evenings, right? So you can put those in too, and then we try to take those into account uh, as much as possible so that they're, they're soft, right? And the green ones are when you actually want to work. So um, we take those into account too. Okay, so, um, so for example, if I would now say, uh, else here, let's take Hugo what does not want to work this this day. You can see it's red now. We're actually losing points. If he now solves this, one of the first things that OptoPlanner will do is we'll reassign this. Um, and he might still make some improvements as this cascades. And this one doesn't actually cascade. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. Good. Let's let's jump back. Okay. So how do we implement this? Right. Let's say we want to um, actually implement this in plain old Java. Um, so first thing we have to do is we have to define the domain. Right, second thing we need to define the constraints and then we need to solve it of course. So okay. So um, we have the... Uh, uh, so what we do is we we get we define the domain in plain old Java. Uh, so an employee and a shift for example. You might have an employee assigned to a contract so it might be a very rich domain of Java classes. Then we define the score function. Uh, like at most one shift per day, uh, the day off request when somebody doesn't want to work to take this into account. And with that, we build a solver factory. Uh, for people using Hibernate or GPA, this is very much like your entity manager factory. So um, you have one of these per uh, application typically. Uh, so they're thread safe. And then for every data set that you have, you build a solver. That's basically to solve one, one uh, data set. So you give it a problem. So these are heavyweight, these are lightweight, basically, right? Uh, these these, these uh, cache, some of the things, these are just, you know, you can create as many of these as you need. Um, once they start solving, though, they, they, they can take quite some time. Um, so the problem, here you have a number of shifts. You can see they're all unassigned. And here you have a number of employees and you have day off requests. If you now give this to the solver, you can see we get the solution. And now these shifts, these eight shifts are assigned to uh, the nurses. You can see uh, this nurse is now doing a late shift, this nurse is doing the early shift. You can also see this particular shift, even though that person does not want to work, we're assigning it to him. Um, and that's quite normal because we have uh, two shifts on Wednesday and only one person who wants to work. So somebody will have to work even though they don't want to. Uh, so how do, we, how do we call this in Java? Let me first do how do we call the solve method and I'll jump into the domain. So we have a roster, right? Which is basically our Java class, my class. So as a user, something I defined to, that wraps the problem. Um, I build a solver factory. So this is something from OptoPlanner. Uh, and you can see it's, it's generified, so you don't have to cast. So you can give it uh, this, from this factory, you build a solver for your roster, right? And you can do configuration there, or you can leave this pretty much empty. There's like two or three lines these days that you still need. Um, and then, based on the solver, you can say solver.solve. So this is the big thing. This is the thing to, to keep in mind. The solver.solve method. Um, so this returns a new instance of the roster, and then, for example, I can grow through all of, the, of, all of my shifts. Again, this is a class I defined. This is not in OptoPlanner core. Um, and you just say, okay, uh, for each shift I have this employee, for example, if you want to uh, output it. But just to give you an idea of how that would work. So this is the big thing. Solver.solve, give it a problem, get a solution. Uh, and this might take some time, right? This might 
r go off and run for 30 mi minutes for 30 seconds or one second. It, it depends on how long you want to run it and how long you configure it. Um, and you can stop it asynchronously from a different thread and stuff like that, but most of the time, um, in many cases, it's just you know, run for an amount of time. Uh, so how do you define the domain? So this is the domain we'll, we'll define. So we have uh, a shift here. Uh, we have a, a shift has one spot, a spot has one skill, a shift has one employee, right? Um, and this is, the, this is usually what you already have, right? When, uh, when somebody says, okay, I have this application, um, but I, uh, currently these shifts are being assigned manually, uh, and I want to bring this, you know, I want to make that automatic. They usually have a domain like this already. And what they need to do is they need to they need to figure out okay what can OptoPlanner change and and that's the so if you ever start with an OptoPlanner uh, implementation you need to ask yourself what changes during planning during solving what what can OptoPlanner change can it say for this spot we'll use a different skill the answer is no right it cannot say oh for the battery spot all of a sudden now you can do you know if you have if you know ICT then you don't need electrical skills right or uh, if you know how to drive a car you don't need the uh, the mechanical skill no it, it doesn't work like that right so this doesn't change uh, so, so some things are fixed in this particular case for this particular implementation uh, the best thing to do was we have a shift and the employee changes so that's the thing that OptoPlanner changes this relationship um, this usually starts out as actually as an ULL and OptoPlanner makes sure they're all assigned to at least uh, to exactly one employee. Um, but it, it cannot say for, okay, I'm going to create an extra shift or I'm going to create, you know, more spots. You, you, could, you could implement those cases, but in this particular implementation, in most of the employee roster cases, this is, this is the main model, more or less what you want to do. And of course, like, like I said before, your employee might have a contract and the contract might say he's working only part-time and if he works part-time, he should get less shifts. You can add all those. OptoPlanner doesn't really care that much. You'll see that's, uh, that's all things you can add in, in later iterations. It's not really that important. The real important thing is this is the, the thing that changes. The, um yeah. yeah, so yeah, this is the decision variable. And I'll show that in code right now, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I'll show that in code. So the spot is a plain old Java class. In this case, it just has a name and a required skill. You know, not a big surprise. You can do getters and setters on that if you want, right? Uh, plain old Java class. You can make it serializable if you want to serialize it, but that doesn't, the OptoPlanner doesn't care. Uh, this is my employee. So my employee has a name and has a list of skills. So an employee can have multiple skills, right? Um, and we added a method here, to, out of convenience, has skill. So you get a skill and just a skill is contained skill, right? But notice that this could be much more complex. And this is quite interesting because in OctoPlanner you can reuse these things in your constraints. So you can say in my constraints I'm going to reuse certain uh, Java code uh, methods uh, as I see fit, right? So you don't have to uh, define them in, in, in some other format. Um, Here's our shift, and this is where the OptoPlanner magic starts. It's actually the only class which has these annotations, uh, except the solution class, but, uh, the, this is our, but this is the real only class that you have to worry about. Um, this is the planning entity, right? So that basically means it's telling OptoPlanner, here's something that's a class that has something that you can change, that you're allowed to change. Now, you cannot change spot. Right? That's, that's my call. You cannot change time slot. That's part of the input that I give. You know, that's my call. That's part of the input that I give to OptoBar. But you can change the employee. You can say, OptoBar, you're going to be able to change the employee. And here's then a reference to where you can get those employees, what was the list of possible employees. But that's basically what you give to OptoBar. That basically means for all of those shifts, whether we have 10 shifts or 10,000 shifts, <laughs> you can choose an employee, right? OK. Um, and, and then OptoPlanner does that, 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 you know, when you call solve, it just makes sure that these go from an ULL to an actual employee from the employee list and taking care of your constraints. So what are your constraints? Um, let's talk about score comparison. So how do you tell OptoPlanner what is a good solution and what is a bad solution? How do you tell them what you want, right? Um, and this is done with score comparison. So um, here we have a, a problem. We have eight shifts. Three nurses again, again two day off requests. Let's say we have this solution. This is one solution. Now there's billions and billions of solutions actually. And when I mean solutions, I mean possible combinations. 
I'm not, you might not think of them as solutions, but you might just think of it as a, a possible combination. Here's one, right? We have signed these two shifts to nurse one and so forth. And you can see we are losing a number of hard constraints here. So we, here we have a, a shift that needs an engineer and we're assigning it to a nurse. And here we have two shifts on the same day for this nurse. Both of them are uh, hard constraints, so th those are red. So what do we do? We sum those up. And we see, okay, we have no soft constraints broken, so zero soft, but we do have two hard constraints broken, we lose minus one hard twice. Right, so minus two hard, minus zero soft. Okay, that's the score. And what is the score? Score is a way of formalizing the quality of this solution. It is something that you need to do because I don't, well, because OptoPlanner does not know that this is bad, right? It might say, oh, you, know, you have to tell him that this is bad. You have to tell him what is bad. And, and he will look then for solutions which uh, do the good thing, right? So here's another combination, another solution. Um, we are now assigning them like this. We see no hard constraints broken anymore. So the, the, this shift now does have an engineer. But we do see shifts being assigned too close to each other, you know, less than 10 hours away. And we do see a day off uh, request being denied over there. OK, great. Um, so what's the score of that? The score of that is 0 hard minus 5 soft. Why 0 hard? Because there's no hard constraints broken. Right? Why minus 5 soft? We lost two points here because it's eight hours in between and we need 10. So we said, okay, we lost two hours too little. So let's say that's minus two. And the way you weight it, you can change that depending on whether or not you think this is an important constraint or not. But in this particular case, uh, we chose to weight it like this. And here's a day off request, which you don't think is that important. So we just gave it mi minus one every time it happens, right? So, but if you think, oh, this is very important, much more important than these, we'll just you know, make minus 100 there. Just you know, increase the weight. Um, and on top of that, so minus two, minus two, minus one means minus five in total. In total. Okay. Given these two solutions, which one would you want to put in production? Yes. Well, and why? Yeah. Yes. So you just look at the hard constraints. You completely ignore the soft constraints. You just look. Oh, minus two hard. No hard broken. This one is better. Least hard lesser hard less hard constraints broken. Better solution. It's, it's quite simple. So that one is better. Okay. Here's a third solution. Um, you can see now we only have one soft constraint broken. This one over here, the day off request. And we don't break any of the other soft constraints or hard constraints. So again, we calculate the score. So now we get zero hard, minus one soft. And in this particular case, which of these three solutions would you think is the best one? The, the bottom one, right? And why? Because here. Um, you know, we increase the, you know, the, uh, our nurses get more, s uh, and our, our employees get more sleep, so they will, hopefully they will be able to do a better job, and they will also, uh, the, you know, they will be more, more happier, so uh, le a better employee retention. And, of course, we're not breaking any of the hard constraints, which is also very important. Okay, so you can see we're still breaking one of the soft constraints, and as I said before, it's impossible not to break that to the off requests, only one person who wants to work. Only, and, and we need two shifts fulfilled, but okay. So what do we do? We look at the comparison between these. We see, okay, zero, both zero hard. Then we look at the soft constraints and we take the highest there. So it's a lexicographical comparison as they call this uh, with, with hard words, but simply put, we just, it's like version numbers, right? You first look at the first number, then you look at the second number, if they, if they are the same, okay. So higher is always better. This is why, by the way, it's minus one uh, and not one. Uh, higher number is always better, and you can have both positive and negative constraints. You might have something like, oh, when this happens, uh, like the ones I showed where if you have the green light in the demo, uh, then you say, okay, then we win one point. So we might actually get to you know, plus one soft. And, and again, a higher number is better. Optopolar will favor the solution with the highest score. Okay? okay. Um, so how do you implement this? So you can implement it in uh, Easy Java or in, in an incremental Java or in rules. Um, let me show you first Easy Java. So in Easy Java, you have a calculate score method. And uh, you just say, okay, my hard score, for example, we started at zero. We go through all of our shifts, right? We just do a for loop across all of the shifts. Um, we check, we get the required skill for that shift. So we, it's based on the spot. So shift, get spot, get required skill. Uh, simple getters there. We check if the shift, if the employee is actually filled in, and if it's filled in, 
uh, because otherwise, um, yeah, in the beginning, they're not filled in yet, so we have to do this null check. And then the shift get employee if the skill is not there. So here we, we re see how, where we reuse that method I talked about earlier. So we reuse this, right? Um, and if it's not, uh, if that employee does not have that skill, uh, then we have a problem. And so then we're going to lo lower the hard constraint, uh, the hard score. Make sense? Okay, uh, and at the end we're just going to return a hard soft score of these hards and this soft score, right? And you have different implementations. You all have simple score, which just has one number. You have hard, medium, soft score. You have, you know, you can, in this case it's using ins, but you can use longs or big decimals and stuff like that. But that's basically, 90% uh, of the users actually just use hard soft score here. That's, that's the one that you usually want to use. So that's how you do that one constraint. And of course, in, you might do the other constraints uh, you will do the other constraints in there too. So what's the problem with this? Can anybody see the, the problem with this? Let me, let me explain why this is a problem first. We're calling this method, we want to call this method 10,000 times per second. We want to have the solution, our roster, change one little thing, and then calculate the score. Change one little thing, calculate the score. Change one little thing, calculate the score. If this is 100 shifts, that's fine. Right, then we do a for loop of 100 shifts. If we have 100,000 shifts, uh, this for loop becomes incredibly costly. This is insane. So let me show you. So what we want to do is something called incremental score calculation. So here we have our three employees. We have our shifts. So this is a particular solution. And the first time we need to calculate this from scratch. Let's say we start out with this solution. Because you don't have to start out with an empty solution. You can actually start or do warp start from an existing solution, which is quite interesting in some use cases. Um, so what we do here, we have, go over this shift. You know, do we have any things broken? No. You know, we have a nurse. We need a nurse. We have a nurse. We need a nurse. We have a nurse. It's all good. OK, here we lose one hard point because we need an engineer and we have a nurse. And here we need an engineer, but we have a nurse, right? So we, this is the, we, but we have to go through all of the eight shifts. So we have a sum of eight shifts, and we get minus two hard. Makes sense, right? First time, we just have to do it. But that's just once. The billion other times we're going to do this, we, we want to do this more efficiently. So let's suppose we don't. Let's say we, we just change this shift and move it to that employee. What you will see is, um, when we do this, of course, this shift now ends up there. And if we recalculate this from scratch, so with Easy Java, what we're going to do is, we're going to check, is this shift now assigned to a nurse? We would just check that. Oh, and that shift, would you just check that? So we're going to do the same thing all over again, you know? It's a waste of time. It's a big waste of time. So, um, but, okay, this is how uh, calculation from scratch works. So we're going to do all of them again, and we'll see, okay, we will now check the shift there. Now it's fine. So we do have minus one hard now instead of minus two hard but it's not efficient. So what do you do with incremental calculations? Um, and those are the two other implementations you can do. And so um, I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, what we do here is, okay, we know this has moved. So what we're going to do is, we're going to say, okay, first we're going to, it was here, let's retract that. Let's undo this minus hard. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to do plus one hard here, why? It was there, we know it was originally there, we're going to do plus one hard, just to undo this basically. And then we're going to put it here, we're going to calculate, we need to check again. Okay, now it is to assign to an engineer, so it's zero hard. So basically we're going to take the old score, minus two hard, we're going to do plus one as the undo, and minus zero as the, the new loss, right? And this is the delta. Uh, and then we know the required score. So what is the impact of this? Anybody got an idea how, how big the, the performance gain of this thing could be? Right? Let me give you some calculations. Um, okay, uh, so and then that's a theoretical one. Um, if you have 5,000 uh, shifts, this could be about 2,500 times faster. That's a lot. That's not 2,500%. That's really two, two, 2,000, more than 2,000 times faster, in theory at least, in practice. Uh, you won't get that number, but you will have an uh, an, an, an basically a, uh, an insane scalability gain. So uh, for those who like the theory behind it, you know, the big O notation, basically if you do it from scratch, um, like the required shift is O N and now it's O one. So um, yeah, it's it's just you know it's it's a different ball game, right? 
um, it is, it's, it's, it's a huge. Okay. Um, so how do we implement this? So, okay, how do we get this incremental calculation? Well, there's two ways, incremental Java or drools. Incremental Java is unmaintainable. Um, I've, I've implemented like 10 of them. Um, you can do it uh, if you're brave, but it's like writing assembly code. You have to check, okay, uh, it was there, and you have to, okay, remember that was the score. And for this particular constraint, because it's a very simple one, you can pretty much still do that, do that delta. But calculating delta is, is, is very hard. It will really take you, um, per, you know, some constraints will, if you're very, if you have the experience in this, uh, uh, like I said, I've done it 10 times and it still, still takes me a couple of days uh, for harder constraints, uh, for more difficult constraints, and a couple of hours for uh, simple ones. And, it, and every time I lose more than half of my time just debugging it. Um, there's actually an OptiPlanner a mode to debug, uh, uh, to, to enable extra debuggings, uh, extra extrusions when you're using incremental Java. So if you do do that, uh, do take a look at that extra mode. Um, in practice, I would not never, I would not recommend it to actually use that on the long term because you have to, your code needs to be maintainable. Um, so the other uh, thing we have, which is actually the one of the origins of AutoPlanner, is we use rules to do this. We delegate the rules, and it's rules is problem. So let me explain what rules is. Drool is a rule engine. What? Uh, originally, there was actually the first implementation did not have uh, an implement a Java implementation. We only added that later, so we can do benchmark tests. And if people wanted to use it, if they don't want to use the DRL language, they could do that. But it has been built in from day one. It's been um, it's 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 one of the big things that because Drool's the rule engine does the stateful calculations, incremental calculations for free, and that's that's the main reason to use it, right? Okay, so how does this work? It's a declarative language, right? Um, and it's very much based on Java. So, except, in fact, this, the part between the then and the end is plain old Java. This is just some Java call. You can do if statements here, for loops, and so forth. You probably shouldn't do for loops in there, but you can. And um, uh, here we're saying, okay, we add a hard constraint of minus one. So when this happens, and I'll go into that what that is, uh, we're going to lose one point, right? So, so we, let's compare it to so we basically, so this implementation, if you remember, we're now going to write this as uh, a rules rule. So we're going to reduce the hard score, minus one, as you can see here, uh, when the shift does not have that, uh, when the employee does not have the required skill of that shift. So when we do this in, in rules, it looks like this. When we have a shift, this is declarative form, it's a little bit like regular expressions, or like, like uh, SQL. So when we have a shift, Right, um, and we have an employee which is filled in, which is not null, and the the employee has the skill of the spot of that shift. So the spot, the shift has a spot. So get spot, spot get required shift, uh, get required skill. If the employee does not have that skill, then we have a problem. Does this make sense? So the downside, of course, is if you use the rules implementation, you have to get used to the DRL syntax. The good news is these parts here are plain old Java. So the snippets between, so here is plain old Java, and this you should see as an end. And in fact, uh, um, I think we were working on actually making this also possible, just doing an end sign here. Because so when we have a shift which has where the employee is not null and the employee doesn't have the required skill then we're going to lose one point. So this, uh, again, applies to all of the shifts. Right? So it's, 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 again, it's a form of a for loop, but you don't call it directly. Um, so the nice thing about this is that, uh, that the rules uh, uh, make sure that this is incremental. So when a shift changes, um, he will know that, and he will do the right thing with the score, and, um, uh, um, and so it, it is faster. Right? OK. Um, Let's see what the, how are we on time. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, yeah. Th this is another uh, case where we're going to where we have like an employee and a time slot, and we can say okay, um, there's a state whether or not this per we can have this employee wants to work on that time slot. So that's what the green you know this is red, yellow, green of the traffic lights. So I don't want to work. I want to work. I don't want to work. I, I cannot work. I don't want to work. I want to work, and um, this is a plain old Java class, right? And depending on whether or not you use rules or plain old Java to do the score calculation, this is the Java class you would insert. And 
Here's then how you implement it in Java. So you would go through all of the availabilities every time to all of the shifts every time. So it's double loop already. And then you're going to check if you know it's the same employee as the availability, the same time slot as the availability. Then we're going to check if um, he does not work then, and we're going to reduce the soft score because he does not work then, and he is assigned to that. Um, again, this is very inefficient. Um, if you then look at it from a rules perspective, you say, okay, we have an availability. Um, for, so in the desired one, uh, we have an employee and we have a time slot. We're going to bind these into these variables. This is the way we write variables in DRL. And then we say, okay, when we have a shift where the employee is assigned to that, where the employee is the same as that availability, and we have a time slot to the same as that availability. And remember, these shifts change during planning, right? So uh, each of these shifts all constantly gets new employees. So when it actually matches with the availability, which is part of our input, uh, then we're going to reduce the soft score, right? Then we're losing points. So just to give another example of this. So again, um, we have our domain objects, employee, shift, uh, contract, and, and whatever you have in your domain hierarchy. We have our constraints, which might use that domain hierarchy. They might say things like, okay, you know, shift gets spot, get required skill, right? Um, OptiPlan doesn't really care that much, except for the fact, of course, it uses it in, in, uh, for a score calculation. You use it in your score calculation, but it really cares about this relationship, the shift gets assigned to an employee. Um, and you can have multiple of those, by the way. You can have multiple decision variables, but in this case, I've kept it simple. And again, we take that in the solver, we give it a problem, we get a solution. Okay, um, so when do we solve to finish this one? And um, So we have, uh, so how far do we solve in advance? Let me show you the, what, what we do is something called continuous planning. So we are today, and we're going to um, have a, we have a schedule of four days, and we need to fill this in. We need to uh, print this out on paper and give this to the, uh, to the employees so they know when they need to work. And this is, for example, what we calculate. Now, what we're actually going to do in practice is we're going to let OptoPanner solve for three weeks. Here the weeks are only four days, but you get the, you get the ID. We, we solve for three weeks. And this is the tentative schedule. This is the part we'll actually print out and give them. And this is we'll do, and we need to do this because we might use all our skilled constraint, uh, all our skilled employees up to the last day, which means that the next day, the Friday, none of them are available because, because they just all worked five days in a row. We've painted ourselves in a corner. So we need to solve longer than we are actually giving to their employees, just to make sure that at the end of the thing, we're not you know, we were not setting ourselves up to fail the next week after that, right? Um, so um, we just solve longer, but we're not, we're not throwing these away, but we're not, they're not their draft. We're going to still change them in the future. So then a week later or a day later, you can do this every day, you can do this once a week, you can do this every minute, uh, depends on, on the use case. Uh, we're going to solve again, starting from here. All of these are now fixed in time. These are uh, immovable, they, 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 are, they cannot be changed anymore. We can no longer say, oh, we're going to change it because it, it happens or it is happening or it is in a state where, you know, it's frozen, right? Um, and here, we are now have our new tentative schedule and you can see there are changes here. Actually, these two shifts now got swapped. Why? Because of maybe things that come in here, maybe people that started taking PTO days, maybe somebody that fell in, fell in sick and so forth, all kinds of reasons. But okay, uh, this is a new thing. So uh, we do start from that one, but we we just continue. Okay. Uh, yeah. For the, the great map on the left, uh, you can say to a tapaneo oh, this has happened and that can change. That yeah. Some input uh, of your of your program solution. Yeah, yeah. You can actually change your so you can say somebody calls in sick, um, and there's a couple of ways to deal with that. Uh, one particular case is let's say you pr just finish this. You say, okay, let's print it out. Oh, but uh, two days in, okay, somebody falls in sick this day. So you can then say, okay, I'm going to change this and let the solver run again, and he needs to fulfill that. Taking into account on this rough pre-planning where you say, okay, I want to impact as little employees as possible, of course, with this change. Um, you can also do things like backup planning, where you say, I'm going to have an, uh, uh, something called uh, uh, a shift, which is the reserve shift. And then say, um, I'm going to assign, this is what they do a lot in hospitals. They, they have a, somebody on standby. And they actually get planned just like the other employees, but they don't know if this is afternoon or morning. They're just, you're on standby. And uh, when somebody calls in sick. So there's different ways to deal with this. 
Um, you can even do over constraint planning where you say, okay, uh, if I don't have enough employees to fulfill my work, I'm going to call in interims or something like that. And I'm going to let Optoplanner not assign certain shifts. There's, there's many ways there. These are really advanced topics, and uh, but it, it's all. In the manual, we have some examples of that. Um, and we're still improving uh, support for that, but uh, we have a lot, we have implementations of all of these in in, in the uh, already. Okay, and of course the third week, uh, this continues right. This is this sliding planning window basically. Okay. Um, oh yeah, who's in control? That's a good question. So uh, when you talk about AI, people are always scared. Will they be in control? Skynet, Terminator, that kind of things. Um, um, first of all, OptoPlanner is not a general AI. It is just one particular type of problem, so they will, we don't have to worry about our extinction, extinction here. Uh, but still, people care, okay, this is a schedule. What if I don't want, you know, what if I say, um, Elsa King needs to do the battery on Monday morning. I mean, I'm the boss, you know, we have all of these constraints, but I don't care uh, about the constraints. Um, for some political reason or whatever, or non, you know, you know, government. Uh, sorry, uh, the boss says this needs to happen like this, or whatever reason. Or there's a new constraint which says, oh, uh, you know, the CEO is passing by on Monday, and Elsa can really explain it re uh, really well, and he'll pass by the battery. So let's just assign her to the battery on Monday. You know, it's a special situation where it's a constraint we haven't implemented yet. Um, can we actually? Um, can we actually make an exception there? So what we're going to do is, I'm going to go to the spot roster, right? And I'm going to go to the battery, and I'm going to click here, and I'm going to assign that to Elsa King, right? Uh, assign that, okay. You can see it's locked. Do you see the symbol? It basically means I'm the user, and I'm locking this, right? You can also see if before we solve it, that we now have a problem, because Elsa King is now in two places at the same time. Right, so that's not possible, right? Uh, physical reality again, right? So um, the interesting thing is, it's not the best thing to do given all of the constraints to assign Elsa to the battery. But again, I'm in control. So when we start solving this, um, OptoPlanner will actually leave the battery to Elsa King. You can see it's. Uh, you can do this for half of your constraints. So if you look at the spot roster, you can see it will leave the this one to over there. And you can do all of the, you can lock half of the solution or 10% of the solution. And that's really a way, to, uh, that's, this is something, it's very easy, it's just to do a Boolean and just to give it uh, a function that says if that Boolean is true, don't move it, right? But it's really um, one thing I recommend to always do if you implement an OptoPlanner project. Because um, the first week you put it in production and you've forgotten one constraint, which might just affect two or three of your employees, your entire solution might be useless, right? So um, just add it there, so the end users can always override it. And you should, and after three or four months being in production and you added, you released a few, did a few iteration versions, nobody should ever be, have to use that again, but leave it in, in case they do. But if you still see those booleans turning truth, you know, go talk to the uh, end users and ask them why are you doing this and how can we add constraints so uh, you don't have to, you know, uh, figure this out anymore. Okay. Um, so, so there's a material way of expressing this uh, phenomenon, okay, yeah. I mean, apart from taking it out of the solution. Yeah, because you cannot take it out of the solution. That's the interesting thing. So um, if you would take, oh, I'll take this out of the solution, um, Elsa King needs to be prohibitive working that day, right? The shift needs to be there. The shift needs to affect all of Elsa's other content. Yeah. Yeah, so it actually affects the, hard, uh, the, the score too. Um, because there might be another shift that conflicts with that, so you lose points. And if you, have, if you actually fill in two that, co uh, if you lock in two that conflict with each other, then you will still see that in the score. And an OptoPlanner will not be able to solve that, but will do its best with all the re remaining methods. So it, this is really a, a way of saying, okay, I lock a part, and OptoPlanner, you figure out the rest, right? Uh, you can start with within a within scratch thing, it's even more simpler just to say, okay, I lock these three, uh, and then the rest is OptoPlanner's problem. Uh, so that's, that's a nice way of doing it. Um, okay, um, I think, what time are we? Um, yeah, it's uh, another 30, uh, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll not do a five minutes break, or, Oh, I'll, I'll continue if, if, if um, it's just a half an hour anymore and I have a, a bunch of 
slides left. Um, so, um, <laughs> let's start with the hard part. <laughs> uh, let's take the red pill. Uh, if you want to get a drink, now is the time. But uh, if you really want to say, I want to understand these algorithms, uh, please bear with me. Feel free to ask a lot of questions. Uh, I'm going to switch up the gear right now. So, uh, warning in advance. I'm going to talk about a very simple problem. Uh, so we'll, I'll simplify the problem, um, and, uh, and this is the N-Queen's problem. So what is the N-Queen's problem? Let's say we have a chessboard, right? This is a chessboard, um, and we have to place que eight queens on those and make sure they don't attack each other. So for example, this is a solution. You can see the, every queen can attack horizontally, for, uh, so vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. And none of these queens can attack each other. So that's the problem I'll focus on in the next half hour. Right? And you can see we can take 64 queens, and it can actually do much more. We can solve this. Um, look, there's still, and now there's zero uh, constraint, uh, queens that can attack each other. And we've just solved it for 64 queens. OK? And if you actually look at that, you'll see you follow these diagonal lines, they will never ever hit any of the other queens. So, OK, that's the problem. Clean and simple. So again, here is a four by four chessboard. Um, place two, so four queens on that four by four chessboard, so four queens on that, and make sure no queens, two two queens can attack each other. So a queen can attack another queen if it's the same horizontal, uh, so, so horizontal line, same vertical line, ascending diagonal and descending diagonal. And you can see in this particular case, this is bad because this queen, queen B, can attack queen A and can attack queen D. Right? This is good because none of the queens can attack each other. Okay? Simple as that. This is what we want to get to. Um, yeah, and this is actually a too simple case because it only has one constraint, it's not MP hard, you can cheat it, but for the purpose of explaining these algorithms, it's good enough. So the first thing is, of course, here we have a bunch of solutions. None of them are actually uh, is, is feasible. In no case, uh, you can find something where no two queens can attack each other, but are they all equally bad? And uh, no, they're not. For example, this one is very, very bad. All of the queens can attack each other, right? So what we want to do is we want to have some sort of scoring there, right? Uh, so like we, did, we, need, we have a need for objective scoring. Um, so that's the first part of the architecture, you know, uh, basically figure out the scoring here. Better score is better solution. Highest score is optimal solution. So this is what we've done before. So what we do, quite simple. Every time two queens can attack each other, we lose one point. One hard point usually, something like that, right? Uh, here we can, two queens can attack each other, and these two queens can attack each other, so that's minus two. A and B and B and D, those combinations. Um, here the score is zero because none of the queens can attack each other. We've talked about this before, uh, so that's very straightforward to implement. So how do we, f okay, great, we have all of these eight solutions. We can now know how good they are, we can clearly see, oh, this is a really bad one, minus six. This is a pretty good one, minus one, not yet optimal. Good. Um, how do we find the best solution? How do we get from an empty chessboard, even four by four, and get to well, even better than that? You know, the, the optimal one, right? So there's a number of ways we can do this, but we we will use optimization algorithms. So they sit on top of the score calculation. They're built, we're nicely architecturally separated from each other, right? Um, so the best solution, and this is important in the available time. We don't really care that much about the optimal solution as we care about actually getting a solution, uh, uh, no, the best possible solution better than any other uh, uh, software or algorithm or implementation there in the time we have available. You might say, okay, you just give me the optimal one. Uh, if you want to wait a couple of billion years, I might be able to give you the optimal one, but you probably want, you know, time is a very important constraint here, the amount of solving time you have. One way is brute force, right? This is probably the first thing you, most of you are thinking about. So well, how does brute force work? In brute force, let's just try all combinations. Can't be that hard, right? <laughs> um, and this is actually not that hard to implement. So we have an empty chessboard. Uh, we don't know what the score is, we don't care. Uh, we're going to put the first queen on row one, on row two, on row three, and row four. And we're going to branch out. It basically means we're going to investigate if this is the case, investigate if this is the case, investigate if this is the case. We don't care about the score at this point in time, right? Because we don't have a full solution yet. It's brute force. Okay, so here we're going to put the first queen and then the second, the second queen, we're going to put it on the same row. 
and then the, you know in the next branch we'll put it on the second row, in the next branch we'll put it on the third row, and so forth. Uh, in this particular case, you can see I have some other things there. I'll explain later why I visualize these, but don't bother visualizing these. One of them is, of course, um, the not enough room on my slide, which you'll quickly see. So then we go down the third one. Just four, this is the third queen. So again, we put it on the first row, second row, third row, fourth row, the third queen. And we do that again, right? So we put the fourth queen on the first row, second row, third row, fourth row. And the moment we put that fourth queen, we can actually start calculating the score. Because this, uh, in, uh, for brute force, we, we, we then only then calculate the score because there's no point in calculating it earlier. So we have minus six here. This is a really bad solution. Okay, now let's try this one. Minus four, really bad solution. Well, better, but minus four, better, right? And the thing you can see is, okay, we did find the optimal solution over here. There are actually two of them. As you can see, they're mirrored. Um, and this was actually step 114. So 114 iterations, we, we got there. Um, and this is out of, but you can see we have a lot of solutions here we're checking. Here are 48 in, in feasible solutions that we're checking. Uh, here are 64. So. There's, the, there's a lot we are looking at. So what is the, the what is the, the problem with this approach? Um, now some people might say, okay, you're making some, you're doing some stupid things here, right? Uh, especially around here. When you have this, okay, we have now two queens attacking each other. Oh, let's continue. Let's figure out all. Let's look at all of these solutions here. Let's let's take a look into how we can solve that in a minute. But this is brute force, so we don't care. So how many combinations? do we have uh, when we would solve 100 queens problems? So instead of a four queens problem, 100 queens problem, how many combinations do we have to look at? Uh, so we're, we'll fix it on one queen per column. And we basically, for every queen, we have to decide the row. So queen A, row one, or row zero, one, two, or three. You know, and for all of the queens, we have to decide this. So how many different ways can we put those queens on a 100 size chessboard, so much, much better chessboard? Uh, anybody have an idea? So let me do a poll here. Who thinks it's more than the number of humans on this planet? There are like seven billion humans on this planet. Raise your hand if you think it's more than that. Uh, you guys are correct. So who thinks it's more than the minimum atoms in the observable universe? <laughs> That's 10 to the power 80. So think about every breath of air, every grain of salt, there's like a, a billion of a billion atoms in there. Who thinks it's more than that? Uh, so more people now, which is a bit strange, but okay, <laughs> given the previous question. But you guys are right, because in fact it's 10 to the uh, 100 to the power 100, which is 10 to the power 200, which is basically this number over here. I couldn't fit it on one line, right? Um, so why is that? Well, um, the first queen can be in 100 positions. The second queen can be at 100 positions, so you, the number of combinations between those is 100 times 100. So that's 100 to the power 2. The third queen can be in 100 positions, that's 100 to the power 3, and so forth until you reach the 100th row. And um, so given n uh, queens, it's n to the power n. So it's the number of values to the number of valuables, uh, variables. So basically, if you have uh, assigning shifts to employees, it's the number of employees to the power of number of shifts, which is actually worse than the other way around. So, it <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, it's always bad. It's, it's always incredibly huge numbers. Um, so, how long would it take if you want to solve this with brute force? Um, right. So, we have 100 queens. Uh, number of combinations 10 to the power 200. And let's say we can presume to calculate 10 to the power 90 scores per millisecond, which gives us 10 to the power 20 scores per year. This is not going to happen on any of your computers you have at home, for the record. <laughs> right? uh, this is, in, uh, you know, this calculating that minor things per, per millisecond, um, I think you need more than the, all of the computer power in the world right now. Okay, let, but let's suppose we can do that, right? So. 100 queens will only take us 10 to the power 180 years. That's more than a Google year for people who know that's 10 to the power 100. So, um, yeah, brute force is not the way, right? <laughs> I think that's clear by now. Um, so, wait, 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 but brute force is stupid, right? We can, we can make a better form of brute force, right? So, let, let's do that. And this is called the branch and bound algorithm, right? We can do it like that. Right. So what we do is we calculate, we again put this first queen on every row in this algorithm. But now we are going to calculate the score immediately. Oh, zero conflicts? Looks good. Okay. We'll just investigate the first one further. 
right? And we'll just keep those in memory for now. We're not going to investigate them further for now. We'll just keep them in memory. And uh, we might get back to those if this one turns out to be a bad ID. Good. Uh, here we calculate the four second uh, queen on the first row, second row, third row, and so forth. And what we notice is, um, given these four solutions, that these look better. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to ignore these for now. We're not going to throw them away because it might turn out that there is no feasible solution, and this is the you know, and this is the way to the best, to, to the optimal solution or the best thing we can find, right? Um, for example, for vehicle routing, this would be cases where you actually are you consuming fuel, and you will always do that in the end. So um, this might actually lead you to the best one. But for now, we're just going to remember them, and we're going to investigate these further. So we haven't thrown anything away yet at this point. We're just going to investigate this one because it's the first one with the lowest score, better. Um, just further. So again, we try the third queen on all rows, and we uh, okay. In this case, we'll investigate this one further. We'll definitely not investigate that one. But we usually take the first one in this particular algorithm. Um, and we try that. And now the moment we have this final solution over here, right? we put the last queen on row two, we have a score of minus two. We know this is a fully completed solution. So we know that it's no longer interesting to investigate this solution further. We can now forget about it. Why? Because no matter where we put the, the fourth queen here, it will never, the score will only get worse. So we know that this solution will be at least as good. So we only care about one solution, so we can throw about this, this one away, right, in this particular case. Um, okay, great. We've just uh, excluded a number of things. Here's another case. We then investigate that branch. We go deeper. We find a solution with minus one. Oh, that's great. We can now. This is a new bound. We call this a bound, by the way. Right? And we can now prune these away. We no longer have to investigate these because in the best possible case, it might end up at minus one, but then this one is equally well. Right? So we don't have to spend all of that computing power. And that's a lot we just threw away, right? That was, uh, this is actually n to the power two that we just threw away, right? Uh, here also, n to the, that's twice n to the power two uh, of combinations we just threw away. That's, that's a lot. Right, um, and we do the same thing, uh, and we do a couple of other. Uh, so here we find our first uh, feasible solution. And the moment we do that, we can prune away actually half of the tree. We just killed half the tree. So, and we already pruned a lot here. So, basically, we might be investigating one percent of all possible solutions. So, one percent of ten to the power one hundred and eighty is one percent one ten to the power one hundred and ninety-eight. So. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's why you get this scal this these kinds of algorithms get this sca scalabil scalability. You brute force this so four queens, five queens, six queens, seven queens, eight queens takes milliseconds. Then all of a sudden takes minutes. Then all of a sudden takes almost an hour, right? Just one extra queen. Uh, brute the branch and bound one, the smarter algorithm, the way we're going to solve this problem uh, lasts a little bit longer, and then all of a sudden it goes from minutes to hours too. Uh, and it does this weird thing there in my benchmarks, which is normal because it just picks some pruning, luckily. Uh, but on generally, it, it goes, you get that scalability wall. So the next one is again more than hours or even days. It goes from minutes, you know, plus one, to hours, plus one, to days, plus one, to years, plus one, to millions of years, and, you know, and so forth. Um, there's this scalability wall he heading in. So, um, yeah, this is not the solution, right? So uh, exclusive, exhaustive search is both branch and bound and uh, brute force, they don't scale. Uh, you don't have enough CPU power. It's never a solution for a real world problem. Uh, so just want to get it. So how do we solve that? How do we do it differently? Well, one way is we use something called constriction heuristics. It's greedy heuristics. Let me explain how they work. Uh, here we have to assign hotel rooms. People are coming in. We just assign the first, you know, people come in. He gets room 701, he gets room 105, he gets a room 703 because it's only left, right? And you can see it's not on the, on, the, uh, on the bottom floor, so it might not be, uh, well, it's not optimal, right? Um, so how does first first work in, in, in end queens? Well, the idea is we're going to assign one queen to a position, and that's it. We're never going to move it again. One decision at a time. It's a greedy algorithm. So first we're going to assign this queen, after it's assigned, we're going to assign this queen. 
after it's assigned, we're going to assign this queen, and after it's assigned, we're going to assign that queen. So if we do this in a plea rostering, we're going to assign, we take one shift, we assign it. We take one shift, we assign it to the best remaining spot. We take another shift, we assign it to the best remaining spot. This is first fit. So what do we do? We try all four combinations. Um, and in fact, if the score doesn't approve for the first one, we don't even need to try the other ones. And we just, okay, the queen goes there. The queen goes on the first position because the score, you know, they all have the score zero, so we just picked it, that one. Um, here we try them, the second queen on a number of locations. And notice we are no longer moving the first queen, right? We are not br branching these. These are not branches, we just have a path, right? Um, so now we have the, this queen. Uh, so of these four solutions, this one is the best one. So we'll, uh, this one will pick. And we're never going to move those two queens again. Notice that we actually place this queen in the wrong location. No way we're going to get to an optimal solution because it shouldn't be there to begin with. But we don't know this, right? In first fit. So this is how. F so then we assign the third queen, and you can see now we're starting breaking hard constraints. And okay, that's just the way it is. Okay, we 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 pick this one, and then we assign the fourth queen, and here you go. This is the solution which we come up with. That's the first fit algorithm. This is the solution you get. So what are the benefits or what are the downsides of this? I think the downside is clear. We don't get the optimal solution. Uh, the benefits of this, it doesn't take a billion years. So uh, there's a, uh, so you can actually use this uh, to scale out. And I'll show the scaling out numbers in a minute. Um, well, I think, so actually, if you do this on uh, 10,000 shifts or 10,000 queens, this actually gets solutions. So that's the big difference between this and brute force. But the quality of the solutions is, isn't uh, that big. Um, and these are the traditional algorithms I talked about earlier. Actually, in fact, this is the first fit decreasing algorithm. This is the traditional algorithm I talked about. This is an improvement over first fit. So what are we going to do? We're going to prioritize our shifts or our things we need to assign or our queens, assigning with those with, which have more constraints, which have more uh, you know, have more uh, needs here. So we're first going to sign, in this case, you know, to room one out of five. So the person in the wheelchair is actually on, on, on the bottom floor. And you actually get better solutions that way. So how does that one work? It's a little bit different, uh, difficult for uh, end queens, but I'll, I'll, um, it, it's not that, cr for end queens, the, the jump isn't that big. So what we'll do is we'll start with the middle queens first. So instead of assigning the, the, the left queens, we'll assign the middle queens first. And why? Because the middle queens are harder to place. They are, have a higher chance of actually conflicting with the other ones. So if you do employee rostering, you're going to start with the shifts which require more uh, rare skills or which are, are you know, the, 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 uh, the Sunday shifts or, and things like that. Yeah, right? So you're just going to start with the higher ones first. Um, although in employee rostering, often a good idea is just to do them uh, by date and then uh, in the date or then by by uh, uh, difficulty. Now, okay, so same thing we do here as in the first fit algorithm. We assign this queen first, okay, that's the best spot. We assign the second queen, okay, we, this is bad, minus one, minus one, minus zero. Okay, good. And again, when they're placed, we leave it like this. We go deeper. Uh, now we start with the first queen here, right? And you can see we're now going to assign it to over here, the zero. Okay, it's still good. We still find solutions. And then if we then assign the last queen, you'll see we'll actually end up in this particular case with minus one. So it's actually better than first fit. It takes the same amount of time. You just have to do comparison here first, just sort those, but that's irrelevant performance-wise against the rest of the calculations. Um, and this is what you uh, then get. And in OptoPlanner, you can easily say, okay, here's my problem, you know, try first fit, try first fit decreasing, where you actually tell them, go, this shift is more difficult than the other, you can plug in a comparator. You just give, you know, a call, like a single function where you say, okay, given these two things, uh, these two shifts, which one is more difficult, so which one you want me to do first in the first fit decreasing algorithm. So you can actually inject your own domain knowledge to make the algorithms better. You can actually do that, right? Um, at first fit, you'll see most of the examples actually use this because first fit decreasing does give you about a four to five percent improvement to what I see on average over first fit and solution quality. Depends on the use case, your mileage may vary. Sometimes it's a lot more, sometimes it's a lot less, like in end queens, it's actually not that much. Okay. Um, 
Great, okay, so we have this construction heuristic that's first fit increasing, which gives a solution like that. But you want to get to this solution, right? You just saw me solve 64 queens. So how did I do that and not take a billion years, right? So I didn't use brute force or, for example, or branch and bounce, obviously. Uh, so what I did is I started with construction heuristic, and this is what OptoPlanner does, of course, out of the box if you don't configure anything. Um, and then it uh, uses, by default, it's using a, a local search. And actually, by default, it no longer uses stubby search, it now uses late acceptance, but uh, that's splitting hairs here. So basically, what it's going to do is going to do another algorithm that uses this solution and changes it into that one. Right? So how does that work? So um, we have a num so the local search, what it does is, is it says, okay, I'm going to take this queen and I'll move it down one and then maybe that and, and so it's going to change it. So let me see it show how that works. One way it changes this is based with cha uh, change moves. So this is a solution. It's going to take this queen, move it down over there, and uh, then going to evaluate the solution. And usually if it's better, it's, it's going to accept it. If it's not better, um, it sometimes accepts it. <laughs> There's some probability in there, uh, depending on which algorithm you use. Uh, I'll explain in a minute. Um, Okay, so uh, here we have a swap move, which is pretty much the same thing as two change moves. We move this queen to over there and that queen to over there. We swap them, and that usually gets, that basically means that sometimes when we do this, we, just moving it there would break a hard constraint. Doing it both at the same time doesn't break a hard constraint, and that makes it easier to move to a better solutions. So you don't always need to have, well, these are implemented by default in OptoPlanner. So all of these OptoPlanner does by itself, but you can actually implement your own uh, very coarse green, very complex moves as you want to. Uh, if you're doing this, come talk to me so I can understand why you're doing this and maybe just uh, uh, have it out of the box in OptoPlanner so you don't need to do it anymore. But you can do that. You know, it's fully customizable. There's an interface, a move interface, so you can do all those those fancy stuff. For the record, less than 5% of the users actually do this, right? So, um, uh, yeah, okay. So here we have all change moves. So just an ID, the number of solutions was n to the power n, right? So 64 queens, 10 to the power uh, 116 solutions. If we ever look at the number of change moves, you can see that's still a manageable number, right? That's still a number we can say we're going to do a for loop over those or, or a subset of those, right? It's n to the power of two. It's still not you know, it's still not linear, but it's not this, which is horrible. Yeah. So um, multiple moves. With multiple moves, you can get to any solution. So first you move the screen down, then this one, then that one, and we could get there, right? So with any, with a number of moves in sequentially, you can get to any solution. So uh, the first algorithm is hill climbing. Uh, so what does hill climbing does? Start from the solution, it tries all of the combinations. So all of these moves, it tries on that. So we try the fir moving the first queen down, the second queen down. Again, this is not n to the power n, this is n to the power 2. So it's much, much less, even though it still looks like a lot. Right? Um, you can see here we are looking actually into 12 difficult cases, only 12 cases. And the best one we take from that. And sometimes there's two that is the best, and then we roll a dice to pick which one we want. Oh, roll a dice, random. Uh, yes, this is how these algorithms work. Um, yeah, it's, it's the... You get a random and score. Uh, random? And score, and then you score, you score whatever it gets after random. Uh, n yeah, so, yeah, no, so first we calculate the score. Once we know that it is the same score, uh, and if there are ties, ties we solve randomly. Um, why is that? We've research shows if you always pick the first one, you don't, uh, it's, it's less, uh, statistically less well than picking around randomly. Uh, especially if you have the same choice twice, then it will actually, you know, sometimes pick this one. Um, okay, wait a second, random, does this mean this is not reproducible? Yes, of course, OptoPlanner is fully reproducible. We use a, a single random instance, which you can seed, which is actually seeded by default. Uh, so you can, if you have a bug in production, you run it locally, you get it again. Um, otherwise, I would have gone crazy five years ago if OptoPlanner didn't have this. Um, so um, uh, this is one of the first things that, that uh, when implementing these algorithms is you know seed your randoms and, and use your, your randoms. Okay, um, so we pick this one. We continue from that solution and we ignore the others. From that, we spawn all of the possible uh, moves again. And you can now see that so the number of the screen is now there. So this is all all possible moves. And we now continue with this one, all right? 
that's the score minus one, the other one lost the tie in this particular case. And you can see, we now, in this particular case, we actually get the optimal solution with the hill climbing algorithm. So, at every step, we take all of the possible changes. Uh, so we look at all the changes individually, and the best change, we pick that one, and we continue. Right? And this is a search path, not a search tree, so it is much more scalable than uh, as you've seen uh, when I run it. Now, I never actually use hill climbing in practice. Why? Yeah, get, can, can get stuck very easily. Let me show you how it gets stuck. Right? So here we have uh, an M-Queens problem, but I've added an extra constraint. You cannot place a queen there. Just uh, you know, add a new constraint on top of the one that queens cannot attack each other. Uh, so if we try all the moves now, and we start from that solution. If we try all the moves now, you'll see that uh, these are the solutions, and we might pick this one with the lost ties, right? So we have a, a better solution there. So we expand that further, all right? And again, but notice that the score was here minus two, and the score is still minus two. There is no improvement anywhere, so we just pick this one um, uh, because, yeah, we stay at the same score, but we change something in the hope that actually that will bring us to a better score. And we then, here we do the same thing again, and this time we pick that one, and notice this solution and that solution. Does anybody notice the, yeah, they're the same solution. So we're just uh, chasing our own tail here, right? So you might actually see, you know, this solution, this solution, it's, it's always the same. It's stuck, it's, it's, it's stuck. Yeah, it's stuck in the local optima. So this is why you have this, this 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 uh, the, this picture it's called hill climbing not mountain climbing it looks it does steps of about this size right and it says okay I'm going down and then it says okay what's the best way to move up well it's back back on the hill it never crosses the chasm it never gets on top of the uh, thing and this this is where you, this is where you get the the best solution so it gets stuck in these local optima um, and, and you know some some small local optima I jump over but anything non very small it's going to be a problem. Um, so in some cases it's, it's, uh, it might still be doable, but why do hill climbing if you can do a better algorithm? The better algorithm in this particular well there are two that I would recommend. One is Tabu search. Um, so the idea of Tabu search is um, you've, this is the path going up, right? This is Mount Lhotse, it's like the second biggest mountain in the world, right? Uh, but it says I've, been, I've already been there. I know how high it is. So I want to check if there's a higher mountain around. So we'll, we'll take a path that's not currently not going up, going down but it leads to Mount Everest, so it's, it turns out to be the good thing here, right? So, um, this is called taboo search. This is not a spelling mistake. It is called written like that, and it's about taboo. So, um, okay. So how does taboo search work? Yeah? Um, if we go back to Java yeah. implementation, yeah. do you need to implement the moves? No, the moves are, implement, are separate from the algorithms. The algorithms just get the moves. So you, so you can configure selectors of moves. You can say, oh, we want change moves, swap moves. You can add other moves. We have things like a change pillar moves, swap pillar moves, two opt, um, k opt I'm implementing. We have a whole bunch of out of the box moves. You can implement your own. And this, in, this is orthogonal to the algorithm that you're actually using. And again, which is all orthogonal to your score. So that basically means uh, this, is, this is where it gets interesting. You can try, give me all these selectors, uh, all of these typical moves with all of these algorithms. I know I'm fi figuring me out which is the best combination. In practice, don't worry too much about that. So we have a benchmarker. So if you want to, uh, so I do that, all, uh, do that for uh, our research competitions and so forth to, to try all different combinations with the, with the whole benchmarking toolkit which gives us statistics. I can actually sh quickly show you that. Um, Yes, yeah. So for example, here I ran um, about 32 data sets on the vehicle routing problem, and this is the score improvement they have after 15%. So first fit, which I just explained, versus taboo search is one of them, which I'm explaining now. And you can see, on average, we get a 15% improvement. We can see the differences and so forth. So I run all kinds of combinations, you know, different algorithms, different selectors. Um, it's like garbage collectors in the JVM. Right. Most of the time, you don't care the defaults are good. Optopanner 2. We don't care zero configuration. If you want a power tweak, if you want to get that extra 1% on top of this, you know, go from 14% to 15%, then you can start doing power tweaking if it's worth. If it's, you know, if you're talking about this is, you know, we have, uh, we spend, yeah, we have cases where, you know, we spend a billion dollars or, or more 
per day on the road. So, okay, then it becomes interesting to that, have that extra percent per day, right? Um, but only if it's, you know, this is by the end of the project. Some people worry about this in the beginning. Don't, don't waste your time on that. Uh, don't, don't tune garbage collectors day one, right? Do it maybe when you go to production and you want to get that extra grain out, out of that. Same thing with OptoPlanner. Okay, so how does Stubber Search work? Well, we do the same thing as we did in the hill climbing algorithm. So we do this move, right? We, we, we pick this one that lost the ties. But because we changed queen B, we're going to put that in a list. We're going to remember we just changed that. So basically, Tableau Search works pretty much like human, we, we, humans. We tried this er earlier, so let's not do that again because we know it didn't lead anywhere well. So it's going to put this one as there. Um, so then we, um, then the next time, we don't try B anymore. So you can see we're now looking at uh, less combinations and we ignore B and you can see that it is now selecting, which is the winning tie here, this solution. And you can see that in the next move that will then become uh, taboo. And if you continue like that, right, we, and, and after some point, they become untaboo. So here, the, the taboo list is two moves, uh, actually two queens. After three steps, you, it, can it can move queen B again. So we're just going to say for some time, we're not going to change it. Why do we need to? make it queen B again, because it might not be at the correct position. And here, we try that, so we don't want to move it again. But later, you know, the rest of the solution changed, so it makes, might make sense to move queen B again. Does this make sense? OK. So you can see, and this is how uh, taboo search works. Now, in practice, you will not even look at all of these, but you will do a random subset of those to scale out. This is something that OptoPanner supports also out of the box. right? Um, but, uh, and again, th all those random choices are seeded, so it's fully reproducible. So this is Tableau Search. And it might seem weird, but it actually works. Um, we also implement similar in annealing, but I'm going to skip that due to time constraints. And um, instead, I'll, I'll jump into late acceptance, which is one of the, no, I'll, let's, do late, let's do similar annealing, maybe. Okay, let's do similar annealing. Um, how does that one work? It's an algorithm from the 70s. It uses a heavy math equation called E, which is that two dot something number to the power of this. So what we do is we basically say in the beginning we're going to accept almost any step, and the begin at the end we're not going to we're only going to accept steps that improve the score. It's based on the idea of annealing, where you have a, a, a big metal rod which is very high temperature and you cool it very slowly so the molecules can settle in the right. So instead of just going directly to the, uh, a cold state and the metal becomes breakable, becomes brittle, you cool it slowly, so you slowly reduce the temperature. Here's the same, same ID behind it. You, the, the temperature, which is the amount of changes you accept which are not improving, you slowly reduce that until it hits zero. So in the beginning, we do so we try some moves, and the interesting thing is we don't try many moves like Tableau Search. It's a much faster stepping algorithm. It does much more changes to the original solution. Um, you can see here here we lose two points, and uh, so when we accept the solution, but uh, we roll a dice. A lot of randomness in this algorithm, um, and then it says okay if it's higher than that number, uh, then we're going to accept it, and if it's lower we won't accept it. So we won't accept this one, but this one we roll a dice and it's now uh, below the threshold, which is 0 0.61, so we will we'll accept that move. So it's going to do a lot of move. Yeah. What is that? That's uh, coming from this table. It's a good question. So based on this formula, and this is the mo most important part is this, the T, that's the time. So the, in the beginning, we have a very high chance of accepting a move that costs us one point, or a move that costs us two points. So one point, we have a 60% chance of accepting that. Uh, 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 one that costs us two points, have a 37% chance of accepting that. So these are all bad moves. They're de de deteriorating the score, right? But we're going to accept them, just to bring some changes in our solution to escape local optima. And, um, and there's actually a lot of theoretical proof behind this that actually works well, not just in theory, but again, in practice, we see this is, is works really well, um, and you don't have to use this algorithm. You could use double search. It's a more tab, tab. most people like double search because it's much more predictable. I mean, it's not predictable, but people understand it better. People feel it's 
it, it's it's less random. But okay, um, this one works quite well, and um, and also across all data sets. It's not just you know this data set that works well and that one not no no it's it's uh, if it works on well on no use case it works well on all data sets. But anyway, so 60% accepting that one. So now we just rolled. So it's 60% one. 61% chance of accepting this move, and it does. So then it continues like that. It tries a number of moves. Uh, this move got rejected, right? This move got accepted. Why? It's an improving move. The score improves. Then we don't roll. If the score improves, we accept the move. It's only the ones that deteriorate the score that we will accept with a chance, and that chance will reduce. Will depend on two things: how long have we been solving, and how bad does it make stuff, right? Um, small, small improve, uh, this improvements. And if we continue like that, we actually get to the optimal solution. And this actually works. Uh, a bit strange, you have to trust it. Um, you have to remember we're not doing five moves or five steps, right? We're doing 10,000 of steps per second. It's the sheer number that makes this stuff work, right? Number of moves we do per second. And then you have a new one, uh, but I'll, I'll skip explain, explaining this one. So. Basically, what you get is, uh, which you see this in, 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 let me show it in the, the course scheduling one, and then let's uh, take the break, uh, take the end, I guess. Um, here we have a data set. Let me pick this one. All right, oh, let's, let's take a bit of that rather on the, let's take this one. Uh, yeah. So here we have three algorithms. The first with decreasing algorithm, double search, and late acceptance. Uh, this is a vehicle routing case with 137 locations uh, with no special scalability things configured. It's a very, very vanilla implementation. Um, what we have here, uh, so um, as to tweaking, but here we have in less, you know, in, in less than one second, first fit actually finds us, first fit decrease actually finds us a, good, a pretty good solution. So it doesn't take a billion years, it takes less than a second, right? But it's not that good. It's actually still far from optimal. So what we do is we use these either double search or late acceptance. And here we're letting them fight against each other to find a better solution. So this is time. This is score quality. Higher is better. We want to get. We don't. We cannot get to zero because you know there's always going to be some fuel and some time that are used to to deliver those items. But we can actually improve. Uh, like in this case, I think it's around 15% usually, right? I can look it up. Um, here, the double search you can see, after five seconds, it's already quite high, but then the acceptance catches up for it, and you can see. Um, so what this basically means, if you would stop the algorithm after 20 seconds, this is the solution, the score you will get. If you stop it after a minute, this is the solution you will get. You see the laws of diminishing returns, so you can see that um, at some point, you know, solving longer, um, unless it's, it's really worth it, it won't really give you a big benefit anymore. Okay. Okay. So, um... How do you decide to stop it? <laughs> Good question. So with the benchmark, you can run this for an hour and then say, uh, okay, uh, given all of my data, you check on multiple data sets. If I stop it after five minutes, it's, it's good, and so you use that in production, that's one way. Another way is you do it asynchronously. You just say, okay, Optiplanner starts solving, and when I need a solution, when I need to, you know, print out the papers for the nurses, I'll stop it asynchronously and take that. So that's the two, two, you have a couple of other ways. You can say, if it hasn't improved the score in a minute, then stop. Uh, this is one I also see often. Uh, you have, like, we have 10, like, termination implementation, and you can plug in your own, your own conditions, but I don't think you should. You will ever have to do that. But it's possible. Um, uh, okay. Um, so yeah, that that law of the score, time. So score time at the bottom. Law of the machine returns, and you can see that Optoplanner that the best solution it remembers that because it sometimes does move that that degrade the solution internally, but you don't really see that as a user of Optoplanner. You just get the best solution and it remembers that, and that's the one it returns. But that's an interesting to know. Okay. Um, I'll skip cloud optimization and task optimization today. I think we're out of time. Uh, let me check. Um, so if you want to get started uh, with, with this thing, for example, with OptoPanner or implementing your own, if you're implementing your own, yeah, could, you go ahead, of course. But if you want to get started with this with OptoPanner, 
Um, go to the optoplanner.org website, click on the download button, you'll get a zip, and you can run the examples. This, those are Swinkle's like, examples like this. You can run the web examples. In here, you will find a WAR file, which you can deploy on, uh, on an application server like Wildfly, uh, etc. Um, and uh, of course, these days, GitHub, right? So you go to GitHub, you clone it, you Maven clean install it, uh, and you can run it even from the command that would Maven exec Java, the right thing. So that's the way to get started if you would like to, uh, yeah, if you're interested in building from source. Um, so thank you for listening. So, what about the, the openness of uh, your uh, software regarding the, the other formats for construct programming, for example, um, XSP uh, tree version or uh, flat uh, minizing? Uh, what do you mean, quality or co co comparison? Yeah. Yeah. For example, if you want, for example, to use your software yeah. uh, within this, uh, this format. Yeah. Ah, uh, uh, in, in those formats? Yeah. Uh, we don't support those formats yet, but you could write an adapter. Um, I'm, there's like, there's all, there was a JCR at some point. It's not really uh, been uh, any success, but we will, if it becomes a success, we would write an adapter. So we are, we are not uh, on the uh, Australian program challenge. Uh, yeah, so you, you cannot take, the, for example, the Minisig format, you cannot take that and put it in OptoPlanner. But it is, I, I would argue that we are a superset. So we work on plain old Java objects, so we can work with shift employees, but also with int arrays. And mini sets only work with int arrays and double arrays, if I'm not mistaken. I might be mistaken, right? I'm not an expert on mini -sick. Um And constraint-wise, you know, if you can formulate it as a mathematical equation, I'm sure you can formulate it as a, as a, pr a programming wise in, in, in Java or DRL, right? Um, vice versa, that's usually harder to do if you have this, you know, nested if loops, you know, VAT calculation, if this country then, it becomes really hard to sometimes put these in, in a medical equation. So that's a big difference there. We're really Java first approach or JVM first approach, plain old Java objects, programmable constraints, uh, and we step back from the medical equations part. Yeah. And, and keep those internally. <laughs> um, so yeah, I went deep with the last part, so don't let that scare you. Um, the, the, the similar needing and stuff like that, you don't really need to know those. Welcome to Castle Mike and Morocco, and uh, I'd like to thank you for the quality of the presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, as far as deployment, on, uh, I know that the solution is being used on big accounts. Could you yeah. just share with us what some of the big, what they do with it? Yeah. Um, so one account I can share about is in the US, they did a presentation on this on, on the conference there, is they're using it for maintenance of elevators. So what they do is they, um, they have, uh, in the city they have, uh, for example, 200 mechanics, they have a few thousand of elevators, and they need to schedule the maintenance of these elevators, make sure that every six weeks, for example, somebody is there to fix it. Now, um, they can only do a number of elevators per week. They have PTOs, these mechanics. Um, you want to do elevators that are near, in, near to each other so you don't waste too much time driving around. Um, you have things like SLAs, some elevators, are in government buildings, need to be viewed at once every two weeks or every month. Other are, are in apartment buildings and only you know, once a year is enough. So um, all of these things, all of these constraints all look, go into that one. Um, and based on that, they say, okay, this, this is your elevator you should look at this week. Uh, these are usually close to each other and so forth. And, and they want to get to the state where they don't want the maintenance to do happen at four weeks because then they have to, you know, the, the, the ideal point for some elevators, for example, is six weeks. They don't want to do it at four weeks because then they're just, you know, wasting money. Two weeks that lo they could have waited two weeks longer. They don't want to go at eight weeks because then it might have broken down and it might cost them cost customers or, uh, you know, and then they have their LS, uh, LSLAs if they beat, if they violate those, then they have fines. So. Uh, all those kind of things. They all work in, you know, they, all these constraints are added in there, and then uh, these decisions are made. And again, of course, uh, so this was, in, they started this in, um, I'm sure, so a couple, couple of, so they started this earlier this year, and it's in production for uh, the, the, for uh, a big city in, in the US since uh, May or something like this, or so, uh, yeah. 
Um, we have other cases too. Um, yeah, across the globe. Um, I'm, I'm not, I cannot always share others uh, to know there's. Uh, I want to make sure I have the, the okay and, and, and I'm on the technical side. But uh, we can talk about that if you want. Okay. Any questions? Okay. <laughs>